we just thank you and praise you for this wonderful day. And thank you for our church family that's gathered together this morning. And Lord, I ask that you would open our hearts to receive your word this morning. Lord, anoint my lips to speak what you would have me to speak. Open our ears to hear what you are speaking to us. We ask this, Jesus, in your wonderful name. Amen. 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 This morning, my message is, God wants you. It's actually the beginning of a series of messages. And they're inspired by a, a book that I'm reading called, What Does God Want? Anybody ask that question, what does God want? God wants you. It's a simple answer, but yet very complex. And it's a, a wonderful book. Let's see if I can, it's a small book. I'll get some copies of it for anybody that might want to read it. It's by uh, Dr. Michael Heiser. He's a PhD in um, <coughs> Middle Eastern languages. And he is the, um, what do they call him? He's over at Logos Bible Software. He's a scholar in residence for Logos Bible Software. Very intelligent individual. Great understanding of God's Word and has a way of putting, even though he has a PhD, of putting things into words that we can understand. And I'm going to try to do the same thing. But today we're going to begin to lay the groundwork. What does God want? He wants you. Well, what does that mean? We're going to look at creation. Why did God create us? Why are we even here? Did God need us? No. God is God. He didn't need anything. Does God want us? Yes, He does. God wanted a family. He wanted fellowship. He wanted a relationship. So that is why He began to create. Now, how many have ever created something with your own hands? When you got done, were you pretty happy? You were pretty proud of what you were able to accomplish, weren't you? God feels the same way about what He created. He said it's good. Take a look at some of that. God wants you. He wants a family. He wants us to participate in caring for His creation. He wants us to know who we are and why our lives have value to Him. So think about all that. God didn't just create you for no reason. He wants you to participate with Him in caring for His creation. That's pretty awesome. He wants us to know who we are and why our lives should have value to Him. A lot of us don't know why we have any value to God. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. He created us for good works, to take part in His creation. They're prepared for us beforehand. Before He even created us, the works that He had already prepared them for us. He already had things for us to do. And an idea of what He wanted us for. Genesis, it says that God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Ever thought about that statement? Who is us? Look at that in a moment. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female. He created them. So in the beginning, God created us. He created us to have dominion over his creation. That was our job assignment. To take care of what he created. We're going to find out that God then placed man in a beautiful garden. And that his job was to multiply on the earth and spread that garden throughout the earth. It's supposed to be paradise on earth. But we know looking around it's not. Something happened. But there's a lot in the statement. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now some say this is God speaking within the trinity. But maybe that's a possibility, but it seems it's more than that. Because God wouldn't need to speak to himself. Let us make man in our image. He already knows what he's going to do. 
We're going to find out that there was other creations. There were other beings in the heavens. Now, we get confused sometimes because we use the term angels. Angels is really not a name for a type of being. Angels is a title, a function. In the Hebrew, the word is malek. It means messenger. In Greek, angelos or angel also means messenger. It's a title. It's somebody who brings a message. So some of these spiritual beings in heaven are messengers. But see, we, we've we always learned to call them all angels. So we get a little confused and, and we get this picture of what angels are by the artwork that we see. Angels are little fat cherubs that, with wings, look like babies flying around. See pictures like that. My wife had a painting like that, a little cute little cherub. You really read the Bible, you get an entirely different image of what the heavenly creatures are really all about. We're going to take a look at that part of God's creation because this misunderstanding of it kind of leads us to not really fully understand a lot of things in God's Word. But when He created it, we don't know exactly when the heavenly beings were created. Probably somewhere around the first day when He said He created the heavens and the earth. Because we know in the book of Job it says they rejoiced at the creation of the earth. So we know they were there when God was forming the earth. So they were probably the first part of his creation. Now there's some that try to say, well, there was a pre-creation before Genesis and they were created then. And all. I don't believe that. I believe that they were part of the creation that's in the Bible. I don't think the Bible deliberately leaves out information just to confuse us. And this whole idea of a gap theory or a pre-creation kind of is confusing because it's not in God's Word. Why would God not tell us? So I go, I'm a literalist. I go by what His Word says. What does it mean to be in their likeness? What it means is that we are to be His image on earth. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that God is six feet tall, has two arms, two legs, a beard, gray head, that we look like God. We're not sure exactly how God looks. We know He appears to us in the same form that we're in. But that's not what it really means that we're created in His likeness. It means you are created to be His image on earth. When people see you, do they see God? That's what they should see. That's why we're, how we're created. We are His imagers. I think that's an excellent term to help us understand what we are. We are God's imagers on earth. It's like the angels are His imagers in the heavenlies. They were to reflect God's image in the heavenlies. So that explains who the us is. The us are other angelic beings. So you, if you've ever read through the Psalms, sometimes people read something and they'll They'll just read it, not really think about it, they'll read and scratch their heads and go, wait a second, this doesn't make sense. Psalm 82 is one of those psalms, if you really read it. It starts out, God stands in the congregation of the mighty, He judges among the gods. Yeah. Ever thought about that statement? Who are these other gods? It says He judges among the gods. Now, this some would say that have, in some translations, they say among the uh, leaders or elders. It's not what it literally is. The word is Elo, Elohim. God is called Elohim, and these gods are called Elohim. What Elohim means is a spiritual being. Any being that does not live in the physical realm is an Elohim. When you die, your spirit goes on, it becomes Elohim. It's a spiritual being. So when it says God stands in the congregation, it says Elohim, which is a plural word, but because it says stands in the singular, means that that's God singular. When he judges among the gods, what is by itself, it means plural. It's speaking of what we again would call the angelic beings. A more correct term for them would be Elohim. They're spiritual beings. So God is judging among these spiritual beings. The congregation of the mighty, we find it called the assembly of God in the scripture. There, God has this assembly of spiritual beings that he regularly meets with. And they help him make decisions. 
the book of Kings, there's one incident when they're trying to figure out what to do with King Ahab. And he asks these spiritual beings, how should we take care of the king? And one of them comes up with the idea, I'll go as a lying spirit and I'll put lies in his prophet's mouth and that'll cause him to do this. And God said, good idea. That's how we'll do it. Uh, did God need to ask them how to do it? No. But he wants them to participate. Mankind was created in the Garden of Eden to participate with God in this congregation of the mighty. We were meant to be part of this assembly. But then something happened. I want to look at some other verses just to reinforce this. In Psalm 82 it says, I said you are gods. And all of you are children of the Most High. But you shall die like men. So when you read that, that tells you right there, those that try to interpret these little g gods as being the rulers of Israel or something else, which they try to say, oh, that's speaking of the rulers of Israel. Or the king. No, because it says that they are children of the Most High and they will die like men. Why would they have to die like men if they already are men? No, these are, these are Elohim spiritual beings who rebelled against God, and we're going to learn a little bit more about that, who he's talking to right here, these spiritual beings. What did they do that God is so upset with them? If you read the Psalms, it says they did not judge correctly among men. And because of that, these are fallen angels, who we would call them, or fallen spiritual beings, that are going to be judged by God. They're going to die like men. They're going to be cast into the lake of fire, we're told in the book of Revelation. They will fall like one of the princes. Again, in Psalm 89, we find it says, The heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the assembly of the holy ones. This is speaking of the same group, this assembly that gathers with God. Now some say, this assembly of the holy ones, these are the priests and these are the... No, because it says, For who in the skies is comparable to the Lord? Since when were any of the high priests in Israel in the sky? Now I've read my Bible. They didn't have airplanes. They didn't have hot air balloons. When were they? These are not, these are spiritual beings. For who in the skies is comparable to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty is like the Lord? A God greatly feared in the council of the holy ones, and awesome above all those who are around him. God is greatly feared among this council of angels. It means they greatly respect him. And again, it calls them the sons of the mighty. That's a term we find in the Bible also. It's very similar to the word sons of God. These angelic beings are called sons of God. These, these spiritual beings. We find that in Genesis chapter 6. It speaks of the sons of God. We find that in the book of Job. speaks of the sons of God. And that word in the Hebrew is bene ha Elohim. Elohim again is gods or God. And bene is son. Here it's bene ha el. El is a shorter version of Elohim. So it's the same thing. These are spiritual beings. And again in Job 1.6 it says, now, There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. When did the rulers or officials in Israel or any other country stand before God and present themselves before God? No, these, again, I hope make the case, this is new to you. These are spiritual beings that regularly meet before God in His council. And there's a reason we're going to get to that, why it's important to understand that, because what I'm going to go through in the coming weeks is I'm going to show you how, why God created us, what happened, where we're going, and where we should be today. It should give you a greater understanding of how much God loves you, how much we should love each other, and how much we should be trying to do for God on earth while we're here. We were created to be God's imagers on earth to expand His family. You look at the Bible, there's so much terminology about family. You are a part of God's family. We were created to be His family. That is why He's called our Father. That is why He calls us His children. You find that throughout Scripture. We are referred to as His children. And we finally narrowed it down to a particular group of people on the earth. Now we are the adopted children that are going to be brought back into the family because we are kicked out of the family. But God has never given up on us. 
Genesis 1.28 says, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. That was our assignment. God created us to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. That means to rule over it, to take care of it. That was our job, to take care of the earth. To help plant the garden and tend the garden. Adam was told to tend the Garden of Eden. Now, how many of you like to tend the garden? You know, if I didn't have the aches and pains and I had the time, wasn't it cold? I love working in it. I love growing a vegetable garden. That's just something that's in me. It's, it's kind of in our family. My wife used to love to plant flowers. There was a time when we lived at the house in Elk Grove. She was planting flowers everywhere. We got to the point where she's running out of places to plant flowers. And she was like, maybe I should go plant some in the neighbor's yard. You know? I need more dirt. She started getting pots. She loved planting flowers. She loved working outside and planting her flower garden so much she wanted a little miniature rototiller to work the soil. So I bought her for her birthday one year. A little, We still have it, actually. It still works. Quite a little thing still works. A little rototiller. She was proud of that. That's what she wanted. And she had it in her little salon that we built in the house, her hair salon. Had it there with the bow on it and the card. And the gals would come in. They saw that. She's so proud. There's her gift. Her husband got And they thought I was the biggest idiot on the planet. <laughs> your husband bought you a rototiller for himself? <laughs> it's like behind your wife a shotgun. You know, she wanted one of those at one time, too. <laughs> and that brought that. <laughs> When we first moved on our property and we found rattlesnakes, she wanted me to get her a shotgun. I was going to get her a small shotgun called a snake charmer. And then she found out that they couldn't jump, that they could only strike half their body distance, and, and the length of the shovel handle was just fine to pin them and get them, so she didn't want the shotgun anymore. But my wife loved to till the garden. So there's a job to do. It's not... And I hope as we study and we go through the weeks that you get this picture, a lot of people think about heaven, and they think about heaven and, and eternity as being a boring place. What am I going to do for eternity? I'm going to sit on a cloud and strum my harp and sing to God. And, well, God, there's a whole lot more to it than that. We are going to be busy. But we're going to be busy doing things that we enjoy. And you'll love doing what you're doing. Then God saw everything that he made, and indeed it was what? Very good. If you read, I'm not going through the whole creation account, but if you read through it, he stayed, he created, he said, it is good. It is good. Then when he got to when he created man, he said, it is very good. We're very good to God. We're not just good. We are very good to him. We are the crowning of the achievement of his creation. That's what all the other stuff was created for, was to put man in the midst of it. But then the Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put man whom he had formed. Then the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you eat of it, you will surely die. So he created a man, he put him in the garden to tend the garden and to take care of it. He could eat anything he wanted in that wonderful garden except the fruit on one tree. And one of the trees in that garden was the tree of life. If he ate from the tree of life, he would have eternal life. would never die. But there was this one tree. He said, don't eat it because you'll have the knowledge of good and evil. Well, he said, well, why didn't God just leave that tree out of the garden? See, when God created us, He created a family that He wanted to love Him because you choose to love Him. And in order to have choice, you had to have the choice and the ability to rebel against God. He didn't want a bunch of robots. Robots can't love you. You can create a robot and it can act like it loves you. You can say all the right things. In fact, they're trying to create robots like that. They can't love you because they have no choice. If you don't like the way that, you just reprogram them and they'll act a different way. That's not what God wanted. He wanted a family that chooses to love Him. 
See, we need to make that choice. And he gave Adam and Eve that choice. And the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. When he created man, he brought all the animals before Adam. And Adam named all the animals. And whatever he called the animals, that's what, how it got its name. To tell you something about Adam, was a pretty intelligent guy. He had the ability to name every single animal on the earth. That was part of one of his first jobs, God gave it. But after he named all the animals, God said, look, there's nobody comparable to him. He shouldn't be alone. So God created somebody comparable to him. Now think about that. Not less than, not subservient to, comparable to. That means equal. It says, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. He instituted marriage. Again, this is a family term. We find the Bible is all about family. He created man and woman that they should join together and become one flesh. He didn't create Adam and Steve. He created Adam and Eve. The problem is today, so we think you can redefine the family to be anything you want it to be. Not according to God's Word. Because when we do that, we're perverting God's creation. That's why it's an abomination to God. Why do you think God hates divorce? Because it separates the people. See, our marriage life was supposed to, a marriage is supposed to be representative of our relationship with God. God does not want to be separated from us. He hates divorce because it separates people. He doesn't hate the people. Now, I'm hoping in these weeks you're going to learn he does not hate us, even when we do things that are wrong. He never hates us. He loves us and continues to try to draw us back to him. But there are things that he hates because of what they represent. Divorce represents separation from God. That's why he hates it. So then we get to the first rebellion. Things are going on fine. God has created Adam and Eve. Put them in the garden to tend it. Then comes the first rebellion. And how God reacts to the rebellions that we're going to look at tells us a lot about God and how much He cares for us. Genesis 3, 1 says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God has made. And He said to the woman, as God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So the serpent comes along and we know from scriptures later on that the serpent is Satan. It says that he was in the garden of Eden. Now he wasn't literally a snake. We think of the serpent, we always see the picture of the snake coiled in the tree, talking to Eve. The word for serpent in the Hebrew is nakash. It means a shining one. We know in reading in Isaiah and Ezekiel that Satan was, and one of, the other, one of them describes how he was covered with every type of gemstone. He was very beautiful. He was a shining one. He was cursed to crawl on his belly. And those are, but he wasn't literally a snake. But the other thing that's interesting about this, a lot of people don't think about it, Eve wasn't surprised to see this Nakash, the serpent. Do you see any surprise in her when he's talking to her? No, because they dwell amongst God's assembly. They, mankind was part of the assembly that God had. They were reigning with the angelic beings in God's assembly. God walked with them in the Garden of Eden. They saw and they knew what a Elohim was. They weren't surprised. He wasn't surprised to see one of the Elohim, one of the spiritual beings. But this one had a, a plan. And after we know the story, he deceived Eve. She ate from the tree. She gave it to her husband. He ate from the tree. And it said, Then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. God walked in the garden with them. They were in God's presence regularly. Something we have not yet enjoyed. But someday we will walk in the garden with God as well. It says, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. So what happened 
because of their sin. They separated themselves from God. They did not want to be in His presence because they felt ashamed. Sin separates us from God. That's why God hates sin. He doesn't want anything to separate us from Him. He loves us so much. He desires us so much. He wants us to be in His presence. But it's the sin that has separated us from Him. The other thing that's interesting, and we're going to find out that God did something with me. He had a plan. He didn't just wipe them out. That would have been the easy thing. Wipe them out and start over. These people are just not getting it. They're not going to make a very good family for me. I'm going to wipe them out and I'm going to start over. God does not give up on His family. It's one of the things that's hard for us to understand because when we think of the term Father and Heavenly Father, a lot of people, their image of that is based on what their father was in their life. Some people had a very close relationship with their father. Some didn't. And if you didn't, you think, see God as somebody very distant. God who is not that, that caring and not that involved in your life. But we can't think in terms of the word father as a, an earthly father. God is the perfect father. He never gives up on his children. We learn that in some of the stories that Jesus told. Think of the story of the prodigal son. The father couldn't wait for the son to come home even though he had squandered everything. And he rebelled against him. He threw a party when he came home. Jesus taught that to teach us about the kingdom of God. That's how God is. He's just there waiting for us to come back to him. He never leaves us. He never gives up on us. He gives us free will and the ability to go do what we want with the hopes that we will learn and come back to him and want that relationship with him. It's also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skins and clothed them. Another thing that happened after this rebellion, not only did they separate themselves from God, but God had to kill two animals to, to provide clothing for them, proper clothing. This is the first death recorded in the Bible. Because you don't take the skins off of animals without killing them. Yes. The first sacrifice was to provide clothing for Adam and Eve to cover their nakedness because they felt ashamed. Now in um, Hebrew thought, in some of the writings, they believed that Adam and Eve were clothed in light when they were created. And when they sinned, they lost that light. And that's why they were ashamed and tried to, to make up for it by covering themselves with leaves. But just isn't the same as being clothed in a garment of light. And the Lord said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. God said, Now they're like one of us. He's speaking again to the angelic host. Because they also know good and evil. They obviously also have the ability to rebel against God because Satan rebelled against God. And now let, lest he put out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So they, another part, they were kicked out of the garden of Eden. Where their job was to spread the garden of Eden throughout the world, they were now kicked out of it because they were kept from the tree of life. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the Tree of Life. Not only did he kick him out, but he placed cherubim. Now we often think of these little cherubs, these cute little angels, little chubby little angels with wings. These are not chubby little angels with wings standing with flaming swords that go in every direction to keep them from the Tree of Life. These Elohim, these spiritual beings are awesome beings. They're Read about the descriptions in the Bible of some of them, and they're just incredible. Adam and Eve sinned and lost eternal life in God's presence. Every human born after they sin is born outside of Eden, separated from God. Adam and Eve had eternal life. They lost it. They lost the ability to be in God's presence. Every single one of us, because of that, are born outside of Eden, outside of God's presence. We were born separated from God. We have to make our way back to Him. He loves us and He had a plan. We're going to find out. 
This rebellion was brought on by an even earlier rebellion by one of God's supernatural children who decided to dishonor God's decision to have a human family. He rebelled by tempting Eve, hoping God would then destroy her and Adam. Satan's plan, because of his pride, he did not want to serve alongside of us. <coughs> we read the descriptions of him in Ezekiel and in in Isaiah, and it talks about his pride and how he was lifted up and wanted to set his throne above the throne of God. He wanted to be worshipped by us. He didn't like the fact that he had to serve alongside of us. So he thought, well, you know what? If I get them to rebel against God, God will get rid of these mud creatures. And it'll be just us spiritual beings, and then I can rise up to a higher position. But God didn't wipe us out. God had a plan. That's where Satan went wrong. We're going to find out that as we go through these this series, that Satan sometimes seems like, Satan and, and his helpers, they seem like dumb and dumber. Because there are certain things that they didn't do it, they could have stopped God's plan by not doing what they did, but instead they went right along with his plan. John 10, 10 says, If thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. That's all Satan is here for. To kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to wipe you out. There's so many people today, they think Satan is the one to follow. Lucifer is the angel of light. He is the light bearer. It's, it's God, Elohim, that's bad. He just wants to keep you from having fun. If you don't believe me, you need to watch some of the programming. That's really what a lot of people think. There's some of our secret societies that even believe that and teach that. A lot of people don't know it, but in the highest levels of the Masonic order, regular Masonic Masons don't know it because they don't learn the highest teachings until they get up to 32nd, 33rd degree. They find out that the big G that's on their wall stands for Lucifer, the light bearer. See, they think Lucifer was there to bring us knowledge and enlightenment and good. They twist it. It's called Luciferian belief. And there are a lot of, not just them, but a lot of different secret societies and, and groups of elites in the world that are Luciferian. They really believe Lucifer's the good guy because he just wants to give us knowledge. He just wants to give us what God is so mean doesn't want us to have. Fun. See how deceiving that is. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He doesn't want to do anything good for you. In Isaiah it says, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation. This is Lucifer speaking. He wanted, to, he wanted to exalt his throne above the stars of God. The stars of God refer to the other angelic beings. He wanted to be the highest, even above God. He also wanted to sit on the mount of the congregation. This mount of the congregation, find, is referring to where the congregation, the assembly, met in Eden, in the garden. So on the furthest sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. That was his rebellion. And because of that, he went after us. Now, a lot of people wonder, when did this happen? That some people try to say, well, this was, a, again, there are people that teach that this happened before the creation that we know. There was a previous creation that God created angelic beings. <coughs> and there was this rebellion by Satan, and then he recreated the earth. I don't believe that at all. I believe that Satan's rebellion was tied in with Adam and Eve. That it was the point when he tempted Adam and Eve, when he tempted Eve and got her to rebel, that was Satan's rebellion because that's when God cursed him. There's no indication there was a curse upon him before that. That was his rebellion. And he drew us, mankind, into his rebellion. When he tried to wipe us out, get rid of mankind, to exalt himself, that's what this is speaking of. God knew that man would rebel and had a plan for his redemption from the very beginning. Think about that. Before God even created us, he knew that we would rebel. And he already had a plan. Well, that's just crazy. 
why did he even bother creating us? It's because he desired a family. And he had to give us that right and that ability to rebel in order to have free will. If we didn't have free will, again, we would just be robots. We wouldn't truly love him. But because he loved us so much, he already had a plan to bring us back to himself. It's just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1 says. <coughs> Think about that. He chose us even before the foundation of the world. He created us after the foundation of the world, but he had already chosen us that we should be holy without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. But Ephesians is telling us there, he had a plan to adopt us back into the family after we rebelled and got kicked out. He already had the plan to bring us back in. Hebrews 10, 5-7 Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. But a body you have prepared for me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. What he's saying there is that, and he quotes in Scripture, is that God really did not have pleasure in the sacrifices that were done in the temple. Those were a temporary covering. Those were done to teach us that God had a plan. That he was going to do something. But he came in a body that was prepared for him. Why? To die for our punishment. So that we might be saved. And it says in the volume of the book it is written of me. Everything from in the beginning God created to the end of Revelation is all about Jesus. All about God's plan to redeem mankind. Says he, all the book is written of Him. And when we read the Bible and understand that, it begins to begin to fit together and make sense. And I hope as we go through the coming weeks, and we go, I'm going to take it kind of very fast through Scripture. We're not going to read all of it because it takes us a while. But highlights, they'll help put all together. Why this happened, why that happened, how we got to where we're at. So we're going to take a, a journey through Scripture. And hopefully at the end you find out that it really sinks into us how much God loves us. We as humans, my wife and I were talking about this on the way to church, it's so hard for us to really comprehend God's love. <coughs> it's beyond what we understand. He is not willing to let go of us. That's the easy thing. The easy thing is just to say, because he doesn't need us. Get that through. He doesn't need you. He wants you. There's a big difference. There's a huge difference. He wants you. That's why he created you. Not because he needed you. Some people think that God needs us. No, he doesn't. But he does want you. 1 Peter 1, 20-21 says, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Saying that Christ was foreordained to come and die for your sins before the foundations of the world. Says, but was manifest in the last time for you who through Him believe in God, who raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. God had a plan. Michael Heiser writes, while God knew what making us like Him would lead to, the result was preferable to not having a human family at all. God sees the sin and misery in our world and knows its cause. It hurts Him. God is so consumed with love for His human children that He will not turn away from His original ambition. Look at how much we hurt God. How much this world hurts Him every day, but yet He hangs on does not give up. He has a plan. God hates sin because it separates us from Him. He does not want to be separated from us. I want you to take hold of that today. God does not want you to be separated from Him. 
when we sin, it separates us from it. Does it cause him to not love you? God doesn't stop loving you if you're in sin. He still loves you. If you've accepted Christ as your Savior and you sin, you don't lose your salvation. But you temporarily separate yourself from God. And you grieve Him because He wants you there. He wants to have fellowship with you. 24-7. But when we rebel, when we sin, when we do things that are wrong, that puts a barrier between us. Just like with Adam and Eve in the garden. God comes walking to spend time with you and He can't because of that sin in your life. That's why you're to confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive them and remove that barrier. If there's sin in your life, ask God to forgive it. And ask Him to give you strength by His Holy Spirit not to do it again. He's given us a helper. When we get done with this series, we're going to focus more on that. We need to really focus in. Part of this is going to lead us there on the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's so important in living a Christian life without the strength and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we can't do it. God didn't leave us alone. He said, I'm not leaving you as orphans when Jesus left. Yeah, he was with us for a while, died, rose from dead, went back to heaven. But Jesus said, I'm not leaving you like orphans. I'm leaving my helper with you. He didn't leave us alone. Psalm 5, 4 through 5. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall even evil dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all the works of iniquity. That's why sin, sin separates you. God can't be in the presence of sin. Isaiah 59, 2. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. We don't want God separated from us. We don't want him not hearing our prayers. We need to first deal with the sin. That's why when Jesus taught us how to pray, part of that prayer is asking for forgiveness. We need to ask God to forgive us of our sins so that he will hear our prayers. And we can enter back into his presence. We should always... You, know, you begin your prayers with praising God, getting into His presence, but then ask for forgiveness. Get rid of any barrier that's between you and God so that He will hear your prayer. And that will bring us to the second rebellion. But not this week. We'll continue that next week. We're going to look at there, there are several major rebellions that take place and they all affect God's work on this earth and why things are the way they are. You begin to see how some obscure scriptures, well, I, don't know, you know, I see what he did there, but I'm not sure why he did it that way. Go, oh, now I understand why he did it that way. It'll all begin to come together. So if you can, try not to miss any of this. We've got to keep it all recorded because we're heading somewhere with it. But the message today is don't separate yourself from God and know how much he loves you. Hopefully that that understanding will grow in all of us as we study this. The depth of His love is so amazing. It just, when I try to think about Him in all, that God could love me as much as He does. Because I try real hard at times to separate myself from Him because of my sinful nature. And then He'd go after it and go, well, what in the world is that all about? God loves me. Why am I... See, everything we do and we do for God should be done out of our love for Him. Not out of trying to earn anything. You can't earn anything from God. We're just looking ahead a little bit. But you can never do enough to ever earn anything from God. You get it because He offers it freely to you because He loves you. Let's bow our heads for a moment. It all begins with opening a relationship with Him. We have been separated. It sounds like we were born separated from God. But when you accept Christ as your Savior, you begin a life of eternal life. Eternal life begins when you accept Christ as your Savior. But until you do that, you're not living an eternal life. You're heading for eternal death. 
in order to receive what God has for you, He says you need to believe. You need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You need to believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, that He came to earth, died, and rose from the dead. And you need to believe that so much you're willing to share that with other people. If you come to that place, you are saved. You have entered into eternal life. But if you've not done that, if you've not accepted Christ, you've not received what He has for you, don't leave. Do that today. Is that anybody looking around? Does anybody here you say, I need to accept Christ into my life? Anybody at all? Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for your great love. Help us to understand the Lord. I believe, Lord, the more we understand how much you love us, the more we'll act like you love us. The more we'll behave like your children. Help us, God, I pray. You've given us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and to help us understand. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll work in our lives. That you'll equip us to live in this world and to share the gospel with other people. God, I pray that you'll go with us this week, that you'll bless us with your presence. That we'll feel your love as we've never felt it before. Lord, I know that there are people here even today, Lord, right now, that need to feel your love poured out upon them. Regardless of any barrier that they put between you and them, break through and let them feel your love pour over them like warm honey right now, Lord. Help us, Lord, to experience the depth of your love for us. We ask that, Jesus, in your wonderful name.